Now, speaking of interesting things, <clears throat> Dr. Muhammad Noor, let's talk about you for a moment, shall we? Sure. Not in the context of vision. <laughs> uh, 2020 vision? No, no. I, I wear glasses. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll move on from that topic then. Um, but we all do have hindsight on 2020, don't we? Yeah. Um, anyway, so first things first, you are the, the uh, Dean of Natural Sciences at Duke University. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Sure. So as Dean of Natural Sciences, uh, I'm in the College of Arts and Sciences, which is where you know most of the undergraduate teaching at the Duke University and most universities it happens. And as Dean, I oversee the administration of eight departments in the natural sciences, wow. biology, wow. biology, chemistry, computer science, mm -hmm. physics, statistics, maths, um, psychology, and neuroscience, and evolutionary anthropology. So like, you know, there's faculty in each of those departments that, you know, I end up working with and just trying to help them achieve their goals in terms of their research and their teaching missions. Forgive my ignorance, okay. but I'm very ignorant off of, of very many <laughs> things. Uh, you you're the, the Dean of Natural Sciences. Yes. Are there unnatural sciences? <laughs> so my two counterparts are the Dean of Social Sciences. So this would be like political Got science it. and economics, things like that. And humanities, you know, arts mm -hmm. and humanities. So I don't oversee those departments at all. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Those are the unnatural sciences. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm an English major. I love them. So. I love them. I'm teasing. <laughs> <laughs> I kid because I love. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> uh, so moving forward from that, sure. you are now also a consultant on a very cool and beloved franchise. What can you tell us about that? And how long have you always loved this franchise? And would 12-year-old Mohammed be just blown out of his mind to know that adult Mohammed got this job? I'll answer the last one first, which is absolutely yes. <laughs> so I've loved Star Trek since I was about eight. I think it was around, that was around the time I first saw it. You know, basically as soon as I saw it the first time, I was like, I want to keep watching this. And I watched it all the time. And then starting, I think, around Wrath of Khan, I started watching all the everything as they came out. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't alive when the original series aired, but everything from there, watched them all as they came out in college. So this was 88 to 92, I was in college. I remember actually talking to a professor of mine, asking, you know, talking about career goals. And I said, you know, it'd be really fun to like help advise Star Trek on the, on the science. <laughs> I literally no remember way. having this conversation. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. And the guy's amazing. like, grow up. Right. <laughs> the professor's like, grow up, get your head out of the clouds, Muhammad. <laughs> actually my, my final professor, not that one, but the final <laughs> one who I had my um, undergraduate thesis with was a huge Star Trek fan. I still get emails from him all the time about Star Trek. <laughs> no way. <laughs> But yeah, now uh, I'm very, very, very honored and privileged to be able to contribute to, most recently to the Star Trek Discovery Season 3 as a science advisor. So and this was like a contract thing. It's not like a job. It's just something I'm doing on contract. So for example, Dr. Erin McDonald is the science advisor for the Star Trek franchise. She's actually on retainer with Star Trek. Wow. I, I, like to, I like to say she's the sheriff of science in Star Trek, and I'm somebody who gets deputized sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. But I got to I got to contribute to that, and that was phenomenal to get be able to have some role in that. So, and so wonderful people to work with too. Are you them. allowed to tell us now that the se yes. season three of Discovery has ended? Yes. Are you allowed to tell us an example of sure. what they would ask you about? Sure, sure. So um, there were I had two main contracts, and then a couple of just quickie things. Then the, one of them was on the burn, <laughs> as, as you may remember from mm -hmm. from Discovery. So this was something I was doing collaboratively with Dr. Aaron McDonald, because it obviously has physics components and biology components. And they said, you know, we're going to have this Kelpian. He's going to be on this planet. He's gone through extreme grief. Somehow that grief is going to cause all dilithium everywhere to stop working. Science that. <laughs> <laughs> Make it happen. <laughs> Yeah, right. So we came up, you know, together working with ID on this. I, I said, you know, my goal was to basically try to make uh, Sukal different somehow from other Kelpians. So, you know, there's little bits of text that are inserted there about some epigenetic changes and maybe he's mm -hmm. a polyploid. The polyploidy aspect is interesting. So I don't know if you're familiar with a polyploid is. So we Who all have, isn't? Hey, all right. <laughs> We're all diploid. So D DI for two deployed for copies of chromosomes. So we get one set of chromosomes from our mom, one set of chromosomes from our dad, right? Hmm. Polyploids get multiple sets. So they have hmm. more than two copies of all their genes. Now, there are a lot of species out there that you're familiar with are polyploids, like cotton. Andorians. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, we don't know. Well, because Andorians, we know they have uh, four genders, right? Yeah. Uh, so maybe, not... I think all four of them need to mate to make a baby, isn't that right? 
Is that true for Android? I didn't remember I that. I think possible. so. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm taking that two steps further, but I thought that they had to get all four together in order to... Uh, anyway. We'll I remember see. there was that other species uh, the, the, with the cogenitor in Enterprise that had the third thing that was coming in there to help with it as well. Mm -hmm. But anyway, polypoids have more than two copies, but the, uh, what you find is that in, in a lot of real world Earth species, we tend to find polyploids in extreme environments that are very stressful because of, say, drought or salinity or, I just say, radiation. That's stressful mm -hmm. too. So, I mean, what that does is it, it affects like how much uh, product each of the genes is producing, but there's also extra copies of all the genes. So if some of them get screwed up, there's another one there that can be used as a template for repair. So that was my argument for some way of making it so Sukal isn't just destroyed by this radiation after being there for a hundred years when, you know, Saru can only be there for like a day and was already getting these sores all over his face. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So that, that was, that's one example. Then the, we, did, we talked about the interactions. I won't go into that because that's more Dr. Aaron McDonald's side. We went into the interaction with dilithium through subspace and that's what caused the, the burn. So that was one. The other one was in episode five. There was the, you might remember when they first got to Federation headquarters, there was that sick alien species there. And, mm -hmm. and I was assigned to come up with, this was one that was more solo rather than collaborative. Though Aaron had a different uh, Barzans, you episode. mean? or which? Exactly. Okay. The Barzan seed ship. Exactly. So, the, oh no, sorry. The sick aliens weren't the Barzans. There was some right. aliens on the space station who were sick. So the Barzans were like mostly dead except the one guy who was out of phase. But the, there, there right. were some aliens on the ship who were sick. And, and what they told me is, okay, these aliens have eaten something. What they've eaten has made them sick. It's a bad disease. It's not communicable. Uh, we need to be able to find a cure by going to the seed ship. So I, suggest, I suggested, why don't we have it be a prion disease? And then they mentioned some stuff about that and then just scienced out the steps that would be associated with that. So right, that really prions. Fun. Prions uh, are terrible, by the way. <laughs> Those are a horrible disease. Like if you go to the CDC website about prions, they're like, there is no way to, to cope with these diseases. The wow. worst thing about prions is the prion drivers. Am I right, guys? <laughs> they Prius. always drive so Not slowly. Not Prius. <laughs> uh, so everybody in the comments section below. Uh, just tell us how terrible Ryan's jokes are today. Oh, I know no. Ryan's jokes. <laughs> Thank you, Mohammed. But Michael's probably right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in the comments below, yeah, let us know uh, wh what's up with Andorians. Some, somebody here is going to know what the story is with Andorians and their procreation. Also, let us know uh, polyploids, what kind of stressful conditions can they be in where they can grow like, like you know, America. Also, not that kind of stress. <laughs> now, Muhammad, another very important thing going on in Please. your life is now that Discovery Season 3 is over, you are no longer bound to not say anything. Um, As illustrated. <laughs> yeah, right. You have your own podcast. And can you tell us about it? Sure. So I've had a podcast going for a while called Biotricky Explains, where I just go over, uh, a, you know, some one or two science concepts using some random episode from somewhere in the Star Trek franchise. Now that Discovery Season 3 is done, I partnered with my good friend and Star Trek actress, uh, Jane Brooke. And I asked her if <laughs> I asked her if we could go together over all the episodes of season three. And my part would be to talk about biology either in the episode or something in the real world that's kind of inspired by something shown in the episode. And she could talk about production aspects. Now she wasn't involved in season three specifically because you know her role was restricted to seasons one and two. She but she could talk Admiral about Admiral Cornwell, by the way, exactly. everybody at home. Yeah. But she talks about just, you know, her acting experience more generally and some of her experience with Star Trek more generally. It just provides a lot of really interesting insights about production and what happens in terms of putting something together like that. So we, we sort of take turns being mentor and mentee in these episodes. They come out every Sunday on my YouTube channel. Nice. Yeah. And we will include that link in the description box below. So everybody check out Muhammad's uh, podcast, Biotrekkie Explains, and also Biotrekkie with the Admiral, I believe, yes. right? Yep, very good. Thank you. Um, sure. Because I, I remember <laughs> thinking, is it is it Biotrekkie and the Admiral or Biotrekkie with the Admiral? Like one sounds like a buddy cop show and the other yeah. one sounds like, <laughs> hey, she's a special guest with me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but definitely everybody at home, check that out. Muhammad is as pleasant as he seems <laughs> in this thing. It is a consistent thing. It's not a one-time thing. And his sweet. show is awesome.